great to get to know some new characters and I think I've found my favorite lioness so far let's actually try and snap one or two pictures of her for ID purposes to Steph who's found some elephants can't believe you're seeing 11 lions oh, Scott how fantastic is that how long ago was it that we've seen 11 lions together in one place a really magic morning now we've got this herd of elephant herd of elephant with uh, some youngsters so a breeding herd of elephant crossing the road in front of us with the largest cow being that one there and that's probably the matriarch of the herd I would imagine that she is either her or another one which I'm going to show you the matriarchs are the oldest largest fittest cows in the herd and will be the mother to almost all of the elephant that you see here with the exception of perhaps a sister or a cousin now just have a look at this sisters usually join up That point that elephant herds can get bigger than the sort of 8 to 12 average that you normally find out here some zebra in the background it's not uncommon for two sisters to join up with one another and to spend some time in each other's company enjoying a common common resource and then to take their respective herds and move in their own ways again now I say that there's a chance that this is one of those groups because of the fact that there's two old elephant here of around about the same age there's one here right at the back which we'll show you in a second once we've had a look at this just look how their tusks are so shiny in these a female elephant and also old you can see the broken tusk which is uncommon for the elephant here and you can see how Quite common for them to just pause before crossing the road, sniffing the road. Enormous cow. Really majestic. Elephants are a tactile species, they they a contact species, much more so than hippo in my opinion. And definitely as tactile as what those lions are with Scott and so why don't without wasting too much time why don't we go send you over to them as well well very happy to hear you had what sounds like a very large herd of elephants and you've come back at the perfect time as these two lion continue to head south they're kind of possibly heading for a drink there's a small little tributary behind them which is may they possibly where they are heading the rest of the pride have bunkered down they are not following now in retrospect I did say they weren't looking very full bellied but no they're not it's just this lioness is so big I can't tell if she's full or just a monster Hello to Michael, you're interested to know if the lions will hunt buffalo as much as they do in other parts of Africa due to the fact that they've got so much prey here, other prey and yes they certainly will, especially in the months when the migration's not around because then there are large herds of buffalo that are resident to this area so uh, it is certainly something that happens I'm not sure how much though, maybe there are prides, certain prides in South Africa in and around the Kruger that are more or renowned for hunting buffalo but I would be highly surprised if some of the big big Maasai Mara lions here do not also get involved and I'm sure it's something that we will be able to witness with you firsthand 
at some point in time. Okay, let's keep moving. Hopefully the signal stays good. It's a bit of a dodgy area this. And one of the we go about this adventure. Scott there and so you're with me now at the moment and what we're looking at is a zebra that's busy having a bit of a dust bath yeah I'm hoping no you're gonna stand up these zebra in this area they came across the river at the beginning of the migration and have been hanging around here not doing much except for crossing the river and recrossing it I think it's this group that sheds a member or two at these crossings that we're seeing in, in particular at cul-de-sac crossing which is where we've seen a number of zebra be taken by uh, by by crocodiles and which is just across the valley over there um, there's cul-de-sac crossing in that area there so it's, I have every expectation that these zebra are part of that group that do that have a look here there's there's some aloe grooming going on over here with these two zebra they're grooming one another and more than just a I need to keep your coat clean it's an affirmation of a contact it's it's a I'm okay you're okay type of activity similar to how people might I don't know you know br brush out hair or you know, help someone dress. It's more than just the activity, the, the literal activity. Cindy, you've noticed that the zebra are much brighter here. Um, for two reasons that's, that's the case, Cindy. One is that these zebra don't have the shadow stripe that the zebra, the, the, the common zebra have in the Kruger Park. And by shadow stripe I mean when next you see some, some zebra um, at Juma, you'll notice that in the white stripes there is quite often a dirty brown or even black stripe inside the white stripe, which doesn't make the zebra as reflective because there's less white whereas here the zebra do not have that that white stripe and so or that 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 shadow stripe and so they've got a lot more white on them and so they look a lot brighter as well um, the rest of the zebra I think is pretty much the same I think I, they still dust bath the same and they still come out brown dust bathing they still have these shiny white rumps the zebra in the Kruger with the exception, I think, of the fact that the reflectivity of a zebra in a Kruger is reduced somewhat, on average, because of this shadow stripe that is prevalent in them there. Why they have it there, I don't know. I, I, I suppose it's a genetic thing, it's carried down in the genes, um, but isn't significant enough a, a difference to, to make them a subspecies to this common or plain zebra that, that occurs up here in Kenya or Zambia for that matter of fact, or Tanzania. I've only seen the shadow stripe in the zebra south of the Zambezi River, Botswana and South Africa. They are lovely though, hey? There's just something about this black and white striped horse that just, I don't know, is attention grabbing for me. Them and for some other odd reason, a giraffe as well. Starlight, you've asked a question now that I don't know the answer to just yet. You've asked a question, how do we know the difference between a migrating zebra and a zebra that is sedentary or just lives in this area and doesn't go anywhere? Um, Starlight, I would say that the... Whew, how do I answer this question? I would say that the, the most obvious, obviously, would be the fact that the, the migratory zebra always seem to be moving somewhere and would be part of herds of animals that come and go. Whereas the sedentary zebra are zebras that would live in the same place. And I suppose over time, you'd get to know, you know, you'd get to know certain groups of zebra potentially. You'd get to know uh, a 
herd mare or a herd stallion or, or a zebra with a particular scar or other distinguishing characteristic on it. And that would help you determine what herd that is and whether it stays here or whether it moves on. Um, but there'd be no, they wouldn't be noticeably skinnier than zebra that live in one area. Um, they wouldn't be noticeably, these ones wouldn't, you know, have hooves that are, are, are more worn down or less worn down for instance it's a it's a good question that to be honest with you starlight i'm i'm looking forward to finding out exactly what it means when the when the migration finally gets here i haven't seen it uh, yet i've seen it with uh, with Scott and Jamie and Brent and I'm looking forward to them coming in across the side and then I will I suppose have a look and see if I can notice anything but right now I can't imagine that they'd be any different so very cool herd let's keep on going Right, we're going to keep on going now, but I think, why don't you go and find out from Taylor what's been happening with those wild dogs. They gave us the slip, can you believe it? After you left, uh, after we, um, the gremlins got us, they grabbed us and they threw Sebastian and I to the ground and they punched us a few times, but we managed to dust ourselves off, we got back in the car. But we could not pick up on those dogs again. However, those wild dogs did come from Vuyatela, I must tell you that. They, they obviously were running around the property. I saw where their tracks come out and then cross into Chitwa. But how exciting was that? Super quick sighting, of course, but that's normally the case with uh, wild dogs. They don't hang around for a very, very long time, unfortunately. But I think they were hadn't quite um, filled their hunger just yet. So let me just recap because I don't actually know what I told you, the adrenaline was so high. So what happens is the wild dogs actually killed an impala near Chitwa Dam and then a clan of hyenas came in and normally the wild dogs are the ones that chase the hyenas around but obviously just being three of them, they didn't stand a chance but it sounded like there were obviously more hyenas than dogs and they came through and they stole the kill. But they did have big bellies, you can see they had blood on their feet and around their face so they did get something and then they needed something else to satisfy the hunger like I was saying so they were trying to flush small prey out we had a look around I couldn't find their tracks it, it was virtually impossible that block that they disappeared into was so big so they could probably be in there some, somewhere but the amount of monkey oranges that they were it was like a complete forest almost like the one that we we bumped into when we first got a view of the dogs and I said that's a wall and, and you know me I'm normally not one that says it's too thick to off-road, we just go, but it was just that dense and we couldn't make it in there. But at least we got to see wild dogs, we've broken the spell now, it has been quite some time and we've been seeing the low sabi, well the, this particular pack of three, their tracks going up and down in Vuyatela, then they cross south, so they're around here, they've been spending a bit of time and now that we know, I know where their exit route was, cutting across uh, Cheetah cheetah cut line and then crossing straight into towards Chitwa. We'll know where to check from now and I think first things we must come straight to this boundary and race up that way and, and see if we can get them. I don't think that they'll go too far. There's lots of antelope for them to feed on so maybe they'll stick around and we'll get another sighting of them. Who knows? Maybe this afternoon. Perhaps they've actually just laid down. Maybe they thought, my goodness, we're exhausted. We've fought hyenas off. We're caught in an impala. Now we've run around being chased by cars and of course we, we weren't chasing them that's just how wild dogs move on on the normal case but how great was that sighting <laughs> James you said fashionably late but I sure know how to make an entrance so Sebastian and I were saying if we didn't have those technical problems that we had we would never have been able to have get, gotten into that sighting at all and I think it's just worked out perfectly because it sounds like they were there for, from the beginning of drive, so you, you know what it's like. There's many, many cars that traverse, that can traverse on Chitwa. So I probably would have been put off on being given a standby 10, and I would have moved so far away that I wouldn't have been able to have 
uh, continued hearing the radio comms on the Eastern Channel. So I think it all, everything this morning happened for a reason. So it was a bit frustrating, of course, but um, I, I think it worked out for the best. <laughs> it was perfect. But we'll go and, we'll go and explore again this, in that area this afternoon and, and hopefully we pick them up. I'm hoping that they did just stop to have a siesta and just relax a bit. They, you know they could have been moving for quite some time. It's been nice and cool for most of the morning. It's still quite chilly. But now what we're going to do is, I, I didn't get to tell you with all the excitement and the hype, we actually will look at some dwarf mongoose. I just want to see if I can sneak up a bit closer. There's a few of them coming up onto the road. We did find male and female leopard tracks this morning too. So we're going to go back into those areas and see if we can't find them. Oh yeah, this is where they're living. I'm just trying to see where... There we go. We'll stop here and have a look at the lot. There's an entire colony of dwarf mongoose around at the moment. I think they've also had a late start just as, as we had. They are just warming themselves up, which is quite nice. Look at those two at the back there. Ooh, another one's joining the party. They're just coming from left, from right. Some of them must have started foraging. There's lots of hornbills hanging around in the area too. And we know that they have a symbiotic relationship, the hornbills and the dwarf mongoose. Even though the dwarf mongoose are looking for insects and tasty little morsels to eat, so are the hornbills. And if the hornbills, there's actually one hornbill, Oh, that one's digging. If you want to have a look, look how it's watching just up top on the tree. Look how it's watching it. So normally they'll actually be down on the ground with the with the mongoose so that if an insect manages to escape the claws and those sharp teeth of the dwarf mongoose, the hornbill will swoop in and catch it. They're not, and then I suppose they, but, oh, that was a big yawn. That feels like me this morning. And then I suppose the hornbills do help the dwarf mongoose by being an extra pair of eyes and ears. So they'll all work together. You're a bit itchy, aren't you? See, I can't imagine that all types of mites and things that they must have on their bodies. Especially living in the burrows. We often talk about the animals not living in the same burrow for a very long time because of the parasite buildup. And well, there we go, there's evidence of it. I think you need a friend to come and help you groom those hard to reach places and get rid of some of those creepy crawlies that are living on the hair. <laughs> now Francis from Israel, you've said that you think they look so small compared to the mongoose that you've been seeing in the Mara and that's because you've been seeing the banded mongoose so they're much larger. The dwarf mongoose are tiny. Remember this is the smallest little carnivore that we get in the area. I'm trying to describe what would they be like. Mm. They're about the same size as a squirrel, I suppose. They're very similar size. I mean, I think with their tails, they're probably just over the length of your ruler. So maybe about 40 centimeters from head to the tip of their tail. They're not big at all, but ferocious predators. You know that saying, dynamite comes in small packages. It is so true, especially with these dwarf mongoose. Remember, they can challenge snakes if they want to. They might not always do like, say, the banded mongoose and the, the yellow mongoose or even the... Slender mongoose, they, their diet consists quite a bit of snakes, but they will too. Remember that amazing sighting we had with Jamie and the boomslung? I think it was a boomslung and the dwarf mongoose. Obviously, they didn't go for it, but they weren't letting that snake intimidate it at all. They were not standing for any of that. There's a youngster. There you go, roll over so I can give you a clean. They're amazing, the social dynamics that they have between the members of the colony. Now actually you say look how cute they are. They are they are so precious. And it just shows you how intelligent they are too. I think anything that has a, a good social structure and no, they've all just disappeared off of the road. They must have an, a quite a quite a good intelligence level to be able to constantly keep uh, strengthening that bond. You saw the little ones running over to the adults looking for attention. Uh, that will keep happening. Now I believe that James Richard, you're actually wondering if I had a leopard update for you because that seems to be all I've been having lately. It's just updates on leopards and not really any cats to go with it. There's a daycare just to our left. I think it might run. Let's see if it's stop. No, it's going too far. Ah, I was too slow there. There was a daycare that was also warming up in the sun, but it's bound bounding off in the opposite direction. I think the tracks that I had because they were on for your teller access. I think there were shadows. Now I know that Shadow particularly likes Triple M and Parlor Plains, that new road, 
that area so I wonder if she was just walking around looking for something to eat now she, it wouldn't be the first second or third time that she's done this to us where halfway through drive almost towards the end of the drive she just pops up out of nowhere with a meal she didn't have there were no cub tracks with her so that means that she's left her cub somewhere and now we need to try and figure out where exactly she is so I think we'll go all the way we almost at the end of Gauri Main we'll go down triple M and we'll see if there anything else is uh, any other tracks have come across if not then we'll go back towards the last tracks and just start bobbing and weaving up some of those roads maybe even slightly further north sandy patch and and just check that entire northwestern corner of the property and maybe we get lucky today i also saw male leopard tracks i presume it was tingana uh, obviously we had his tracks we know the route that he walks from Buffelshook Dam yesterday morning straight in towards Buffelshook itself and he must have popped out just after safari ended and he must have been doing a loop in Buffelshook and then coming back turning west he walks some of the same, same routes he called right into the night he's obviously been picking up the scents of the other leopards that have been moving in his territory and he mm, doesn't seem to be too happy about that but we'll keep searching hopefully our luck is going to change we're going to have some spotted cats too this morning but we'll keep you updated let's go back across to Kenya and Steph and I'm not sure what he's got but I'm sure it'll be fantastic Yes, welcome all the way back here yeah, as quick as that in the blink of an eye and uh, we've just managed to come around the corner from where we were with those elephants a little bit earlier and all those zebra now we are close to the crossings and although having been on crossing camera duty for the last couple of days um, we haven't had much in terms of action early in the day it tends to be later on in the day in particular later on in the afternoons there's always something going on over here it's never a bad idea to come and have a look and see what you can see over here and see if what the potential is here for for something amazing so right now we've just got some impala some thompson's gazelle and some elephant I'm going to see if I can get you around the corner and show you some of these ellies. The wind has picked up a little bit, which is not uncommon for this part of the world, for it to pick up during the day. But this dry season, just like Taylor yesterday had that fire that she was showing you, there is a chance that these grasslands ignite for whatever reason. And can you imagine a fire out here with this amount of grass? And not very many roads, not very many fire breaks. Probably end up burning for weeks. Lenny, you'd like to know what animals uh, occur in the Mara that doesn't occur at Juma. The most noticeable is a tiny little gazelle called a Thompson's gazelle. And there's quite a few of them around here. I'll, t I'll see if we can find you one. The Thompson's gazelle or Grant's gazelle. The other one is, of course, the topi. We have wildebeest and hartebeest in the Kruger National Park, although you don't really see hartebeest at all at, uh, at Juma. It's a rare thing to see there, if at all, in actual fact. Uh, but we do get um, here the topi. What else do we get? The Grant's gazelle, Thompson's gazelle, topi. Coke's hartebeest you don't find uh, at all um, in South Africa. Um, the Dick Dick, which is a tiny little antelope, probably no bigger than this, that you only find here as well. Oh, and then Senzo has just said, what about Eland? Um, yes, Eland is a good one. We do find Eland in the Kruger National Park. Not that common though at, uh, at, at Juma at all because they enjoy the drier parts of the Kruger National Park but you do find eland in both areas although a lot more common here than what you would find it there um, let's go down here and see if we can find you 
Thompson's gazelle. This is that elephant herd that's coming down here, so it'd be quite nice to see if they're crossing the river. I'm about to show you what the Mara River looks like. Now, Blue Raptor, you wanted to know if there's any Chemsbuck or Blessbuck in the Mara. There's no Chemsbuck or Blessbuck in the Mara. I think the closest that comes, uh, the closest thing that comes to a Blessbuck here would be um, probably one of the Hartebeest or the Topi. They're all part of the same sort of bigger group of animals or bigger collection of animals. Um, and then in terms of Oryx or the Chemsbuck, wow, what would be the closest here to that? Probably an impala, I would imagine, but there isn't something even remotely close to that. Maybe an elan. But no, definitely not something as spectacular as those desert living hemsbuck with their long, straight, beautiful horns and their flowing tails. Almost touching at the tip. In actual fact, from this angle, it looks like they're touching at the tip, eh? So much so that the one looks like it's even splintered the other one. How bizarre. Yes, they are touching. Are they? I've never seen tusks like that. Past each other, but never meeting at that length, meeting at the tip. Can you imagine the symmetry in those tusks because of that? Good genes in that elephant. Although, probably not that helpful when it comes down to feeding because she won't be able to use it as a lever. As a point, I mean, I'm sure she's come up with a hundred different uses for that. So, looks like the youngsters are watching today. All the way from Oregon, we've got William, who's only eight years old, and he's made a statement to say that he's seen in a cartoon somewhere that elephants will walk in a line and hold tails. Little boy, I watched the same cartoon, and I think it's the Jungle Book, where the elephants walked around holding each other's trunk to tail. And while you do see elephants touching one another all the time, and quite often, just like that elephant you're watching there now, where the trunk and the tail will be in the same vicinity, they don't walk around holding tails. So you are 90% right there, William, in the fact that elephants will walk in a line, they will quite often touch each other, the tip of the trunk to the back end of the, of the elephant, but they don't hold tails and walk in a line like we do with our parents when we're in a Good observation there though, William. Either grass for the evening or would have been eating woody species of plants on their escarpment in the mountains. They've now come down for a drink. You can see the mountains there in the background. They've now come down for a drink spend the rest of the day in the thick bush on the edge of this river. It would offer a slightly better diet, or a slightly different diet, let me say that, not better, a slightly different diet to that that they've had for the last couple of hours. And Ellie's, this time of the year, in this area, are probably eating anywhere from, I don't know, 12 to about 14, 15 hours a day. And will as much as possible try and change up their diet. They've got a very wide diet, it's what makes their dung such fantastic compost. That now trunk up is an inquisitive elephant. That's what elephants do when they're unsure of something, is they put their trunk up. It gives them a better ability to smell. Something's happening at the top there. You see how the Ellie's have now turned around? Either one needs to be disciplined. One, there's an older cow at the top there that doesn't want to move. Doesn't like the fact that the youngsters are pushing her around. I see they've now found a different way up the, the, the pathway.
Rishi, you've asked if, if it's the biggest herd that I've seen in the Mara. Uh, definitely one of the biggest, Rishi. I was actually just contemplating that myself. We've seen two massive herds of elephant, relatively speaking, today. I mean, easily, easily over the 20 to 25 elephant each. And I've been thinking about it since we saw the first one, and this is the second large herd of elephant we've seen. Is it the largest herd I've seen since I've got to the Mara? Probably today. I would imagine that that's the case, and I'm trying to think of a reason why. Now it is dry, it's, the vegetation is definitely not what it should be. There is only this water around, really, really, uh, and, and, and this will provide the most water for these animals, and so it's not unfeasible to think that family groups will actually join up to feed on good quality grass and then come down to the river together to come and get something to drink and then spend the rest of the day in the, in the woods, in the forests around here. I mean, they'll all be concentrated on this area around midday when they're going to be trying to get out of the sun out on the grassy plain. So, you know, is it, a, is it a, 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 an effect of the drought? Possibly. Tough to say there, Rishi. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to think of it for the, or on it for the rest of the day. Hey, we're looking at two elephants here, one with almost identical tusks, a rarity, and then the other one had his tusk cracked and busted, which is not a common thing here. Common in the Kruger National Park, very common in Botswana. with very symmetrical straight tusks which is common in the Mara but uncommon elsewhere in Africa and then one with no tusks at all which is Africa for a long time in Kenya and Tanzania tuskless elephants were actually shot out uh, there was a belief that elephants with no tusks wouldn't be allowed to breed and um, and so they actually shot out these elephants without tusks as we see Um, if you wouldn't mind just confirming the name, Kirsty, I think it's Nathan. Nathan, you've just wanted to know how long tusks um, can get in 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 well in African elephant. I suppose is the first part of your question. Here in this part of the world, um, quite long. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of elephants here. I think it's about 11 individuals. Might be slightly more than that. Massive tusks out here in the in the in in this part of the world. Um, easily as big as some of the biggest tuskers that you'll see in the Kruger National Park. But the largest. massive size anymore um, perhaps uh, you know 10 20 individuals at most um, and they're all well documented I mean I would I would urge you to go and have a look for the big elephants um, of the Masa Mara and the Mara Triangle there's information about them there's also information about the big tuskers in the Kruger National Park now why don't you share with me what the heaviest tusked bull is at uh, at the moment, you can use the hashtag Safari Live, and I'd like to share it with everybody else out there. I know that the, I know what the heaviest tusked elephant uh, weighed, um, but the heaviest tusk or the largest tusks today, I'm not too sure. I, I have a feeling it's probably in the Kruger Park, but it may be a tusked bull in Amboseli. Um, massive elephant there could even be a forest elephant i doubt though that they'd get as big as the kruger national parks ellie but definitely see if you can find it before the end of the show and let us know and i'll share it with everyone out there all right we're going to carry on going here's a fish eagle that's just come in now which is why these birds are starting to fly up so there's a fish eagle that basically there it is decided that it'll come in here and disturb all the birds <laughs> ask if that is done out of spite I mean, he's not landed he didn't try and steal anyone's fish what are you doing he's... so that fish eagle basically just came in here caused a bit of strife here amongst anything that's a grey heron now has decided to land in the bush after chasing everything away. 
All right, on that note, why don't we send you over to Taylor and see what she's up to. It might be easy. There it goes. I wonder if that's the pair. <laughs> it just flew out of frame. <laughs> Pesky cameras. Off it goes. There we go. There's the pair of them. How nice is that? This very quickly caught our attention. Well spotted, Seb. Now, we're driving around. We're trying to follow up on that female leopard, but they've started grading the road, so my tracks that I'd spotted earlier are now gone. <laughs> so I can't r recall which way they were going, because they were just going straight down via Teller Access, but they obviously turned off somewhere. So we're seeing if we can sneakily find some of them. But now, something else that I'm really hoping that we're going to see is, obviously, yesterday we spent quite a bit of time watching the fires and we're talking quite a bit about conservation and how important it is to burn fire breaks one of the one of my fond memories of uh, burning fire breaks is well what happens afterwards is that obviously it's all gone out the grass is burnt if I touch it my fingers will go black the same thing happens when a lion and a leopard walks over an area like that and I'll never forget it actually happened all the time in the Eastern Cape because the grounds aren't soft and sandy like they are here they're quite hard and when you could see when the lines had walked over them because they'd leave black tracks on the ground how cool is that so instead of having footprints in the sand you'd still have them but they'd be lined with the with the the black sort of ash it was really cool but you can see it's all put out there are a couple of smoldering logs uh, this morning but nothing to worry about I'm sure they'll do another check just to come and spray some water on them so that's what I was hoping to see this morning but I haven't been lucky just yet maybe it's just because the substrate is so soft in this area we'll see what we can find there's lots of lion tracks not from the Nkuhuma pride though oh, I don't think that the Nkuhumas cross back over like they normally do I think they stayed in the west I also didn't get to hear if anything had happened, uh, oh, sorry, if they, they managed to find them again. Let's go down, let's go down this way. There's also lots of human tracks, so they must have been looking at something around here. Let me just see if I can spot which tracks they were following. All right. oh, let's see. Lots of white-tailed mongoose tracks though. Again, also probably looking for the insects that may have lost their homes to this little fire. They wouldn't go to waste though. Lots, lots of animals out here. They'd be quite happy to eat them. And here's some forktail drongos. Where are you? Uh, it's quite far away. Okay, we'll keep going down. I heard the hyenas at one point too, but they weren't uh, calling like they normally do, or like they yesterday. There wasn't that much commotion. There was just the the odd whooping sound. Obviously going off looking for things to eat. I wonder which clan it was that was actually fighting with the wild dogs on Chitwa. It could be our clan. They go down that way quite often. We often see their tracks crossing out. Well, if I wonder if it was the clan coming from Elephant Plains, perhaps. But now that the wind is starting to pick up, we're going to have to start checking down the drainage lines again for animals. Now, Bobby, you're wondering if that hyena that died, um, his death could have been caused by the wild dogs. It could have. Wild dogs wouldn't normally sort of savagely rip apart a hyena. They do obviously have conflict with one another on a regular basis, but the dogs normally just nip at them, you know, bite them. I've, ne I've never seen wild dogs actually tearing a hyena up. Uh, they, they wouldn't really want to eat it either. And they just normally just sort of get so annoyed they just give them a bit of a hiding and, and send them on their way also the other thing that makes me think that it wasn't because of the wild dogs is because we hadn't seen any wild dog tracks up that side however there were lions and there were leopards or there were tingana and mvula were in the area so i think it was one of them it could have been a snake although i believe that that Scarback was quite an old hyena maybe it was just natural causes maybe her time had just come too that's another thing but like I said, unfortunately, it wasn't possible to get an ID on that hyena, which is a pity. But I just think that we have to put two and two together now, especially with that little cub. We're not, not seeing it being uh, suckling once and then, of course, watching it deteriorate like this. Mom wouldn't just abandon that cub for no reason. I think she definitely invested a bit of time into raising her cub, but no luck, which is, of course, it's devastating. I think 
you know, I, would, I sit here and think, oh, you know, I really hope something like a wild dog or another clan of hyenas or a lion or a leopard goes through there and puts that poor little thing out of its misery. And to me, that just seems like the most humane thing rather than letting it, you know, starve to death because in reality, that's actually what's happening. And, and we, we keep saying how nature is so cruel at times, but we cannot intervene. We really can't. We need to learn as humans to draw the line. And I think we need to start with nature. I think we've damaged it enough. This type of thing happens all the time. You know, it, you, you see it. You hear stories of lionesses being killed by males and maybe the cubs get away but then they die. Or leopards losing, adult leopards dying, cubs dying. Same thing will happen with a hyena, with wild dogs, with all these types of things. So it's very sad. It's not nice. I tell you right now, there's not one person out here that, that is enjoying what's going on but we have to. We just have to let nature take its course. Right, well, let's see what else is around here. The birds seem to be fairly quiet. I can hear the odd turtle dove calling. Oh, it's right up on the top of that tree. Won't be able to get it. Oh, who's here? Franklin's. Hi, Franklin's. Oh, they're hiding in the grass now. I don't know if you'll... You might just be able to see the tops of their heads moving around. You can see all the grass moving. Oh, there they are. Just at the back. Crested Franklin's, an entire family of them. You can see how they get lost in the dry grass at this time of the year. Although, actually, in summer, they also just completely disappear in the grass because it's so tall, even though it is green. They're such small little birds. You can see them they're coming out now, just to the right. Over there? Yeah, quite far out they move. I wonder how many are here. But this is basically a male and female that will be their offspring or their youngsters. They're little chicks that are now looking very much adult-like. And eventually they'll disperse and go on their way too and find a mate and start a family of their own. There's also a horn. Where's the hornbill? Let me roll forward and see if we can find this hornbill making a nice call. I saw it fly. What's something we haven't actually... Oh, there it goes. There's one up top there. We haven't actually seen hornbills doing their beautiful... Ah, oh, I know if it flies. And there it goes. Not sticking around this morning, that's fine. We'll find some others who will be obliging. Alright. I haven't seen many impala today either. Just one or two here and there in the thicket, but that's really it, I'm afraid. Haven't seen any in Yala or Kudu. But again, I just think it was the cold weather. Now that the wind has picked up, everything's moving out of the open and into the dense vegetation too. It would be nice when the elephants decide to come back again. It'll be quite great. Al oh, I always worry Alice goes very quiet and then I don't know if I'm all fair. Jacqueline, you're wondering if animals ever just drop dead, like uh, humans sometimes do. So I suppose from what cardiac arrest, aneurysms, that type of thing. I'm sure to an extent they most certainly do. But uh, you know we might not necessarily see that. See uh, who's sorry, hang on. I just want to see whose foot. Oh no, it's a hyena tracks going up and down here. Um, we don't necessarily do autopsies on say smaller animals, so something like an impala. Or a zebra, if it's dead and in the bush, normally something finds it and will gobble it up before we can even determine what it caused the death. But yes, I've found many animals out in the bush before that were just dead and they didn't have any sort of sign. Here's some, here, don't fly away, guys. There's a whole party of yellow billed hornbills. You know, that you wouldn't see any evidence, no bite marks, you know, no swollen joints or anything like that, say from a snake and no visible signs no discharge coming from the eyes or the nose or the mouth and then it becomes very difficult so I'm sure a cold shock I suppose is a good one that that would um, be one something that happens quite often especially to younger animals and compilo we'll see there wildebeest the same thing will happen but I'm sure it's exactly the same how nice is that two different species of hornbills oh, oh look at those that's so precious actually the one on the right looks so cold 
although now you're opening up your mouth it's not opening up its mouth to do the the whole cooling mechanism it was just stretching its beak slightly but they do look a bit miserable and a bit grumpy this morning don't you think although hornbills always have that particular grumpy look on their faces they never look like they're too pleased with life hello fellas <laughs> didn't I call them the accountant no no that was the southern ground hornbills are the accountants of the bush they they always remind me of a CA or something along those lines. Now I wonder why they're all sitting here. Because there's a whole bunch of hornbills that you saw. There's also, there's also a red-billed hornbill at one point. It's flown off now. So I don't know if they're waiting for insects or if this is just the perfect spot. A little bit sheltered and then warming up in the sun. Maybe that's what they're doing. And that's what, Sebast uh, that's what Sebastian and I are doing too. Because we're enjoying the warmth. We've got our blankets to keep us nice and warm. Oh, look here. What's this one's got a stone or something, a piece of mud in its mouth? It just dropped it. Let's see if it picks it up again. This one right here. What are you doing? Are you bringing presents? What it also could have been doing, though, is sometimes white hornbills will do is they'll pick up parts of termite mounds and try and, oh, the, the soil and try and crack it in their beaks and then hope that they find a chamber that has got some termites in it so maybe that's what it was attempting to do this one is now pretending to be a woodpecker unfortunately hornbill your beak is not designed to do that of a woodpecker maybe it's trying to chase some prey out that is perhaps inside the bark Leonard you say that hornbills are just the coolest ever they are I think they're interesting birds to watch I like it particularly when they dust bathe See, look, it's going down again. See, it's picked up something else. Maybe the other thing it could be doing is that perhaps it wants to... What have you got in your mouth? I can't see what it... Oh, no, it's dropped it. It's going down to pick it up again. And it's also going to maybe take a gift to its mate. What on earth is in your mouth? A snail. No? It is a snail. No. My goodness, we don't often see snails. Well, we haven't. We normally see African land snails after the rain, but we know that they can hide away for quite some time. Are you going to eat that? Yes, it just crushed it with its beak. I don't think that there was anything inside. The fact that it crushed that so easily and it didn't pull out any tasty treats must mean that there's nothing in there. Come on, find something else for us. Who are you giving the evil eye to? <laughs> They're so funny, these words. Look at them all. Let's see if they're going to copy and fly away too. Beautiful big eyes though. Hornwheels have to have good eyesight as well. You see they're searching for their prey. The insects that fly around. I don't think their sense of smell would be necessarily necessary. No? What am I trying to say? necessarily well adapted I suppose their eyesight and their hearing would be slightly better some birds I'm sure have better senses than others in, in terms of sense of smell I think it just depends on what they feed on but imagine being do you think it would be sore if you got pecked by that bird if you put your finger in between its beak and it clamped its beak shut I, I think that would be quite sore because inside the beak it doesn't look very smooth it looks like it's almost got serrated edges to it do you see that I reckon that would be quite sore Ooh flying right in front of us. I think it would be quite sore if, that, if you got your finger in there. So there we go. Don't try and feed the birds because they might even hurt you. The hyenas were busy again. They're going up and down, up and down like they do every single day. I just don't know where they ended up. They didn't come into camp last night, that's for sure. I heard them on just on the outskirts. Right. I'm going to send you back to Steph now. He's also on a bumble, but at least you've got some beautiful scenery to have a look at. We definitely are on a bit of a bumble at the moment. We're trying to cross over from one valley to another, and it's. I don't know this place as well as what my uh, my friends do, and uh, I've taken the long way around, unfortunately, which has left me stuck on this big, on this crest, 
and uh, there's not much up here because it's just grassland and I would imagine that without the wildebeest here there's not much reason to come here in the middle of the day it gets hot of course and there's no water but we will be dropping off very soon into the valley again on the other side of this crest and I'm hoping my luck changes over there I can get to show you some stuff again right now though the wind is buffering us I can hardly hear anything mainly because my ears are about four times the size of anyone else's over here and they catch a lot of noise um, but that very typical landmark that you see there those three uh, aerials that you see there that is Serena Lodge and uh, Serena is one of the biggest of the camps that exist within the actual Mara, Mara uh, Triangle itself and a nice place to come in, a nice landmark at least anyway. I'm going to answer your question in a sec. Just want to get out of all the dust. Uh, John, you asked how old is the Maasai Mara and did dinosaurs ever roam the place? Um, it's good that you asked that question because I could probably ask answer that one. If you had asked me how old the reserve is, the Maasai Mara Reserve, I don't have a clue at this moment. I don't know my history that well of this place. But this is a fairly new, new land. about that everybody it seems as though my goodness the gremlins are attacking us what has got those kudu racing off maybe it was just one female getting slightly started but they all just ran there we go you can see some of the youngsters and that white flash of the tail the one adult doesn't look bothered at all she's probably still wondering what did, what startled you guys what did you what did you see? Testing out their legs. Yes, you can run fast. And look how high you can jump as well. You're a very smart little kudu, but actually no, you're not. Stop running and stop wasting all your energy because if some lions come out there or a pack of wild dogs, you're going to regret using all that built-up energy. It's coming around again. There's racing stripes. Well, not race. Yeah, I suppose it could be racing stripes. Kudus have got stripes on their bodies. Just not the typical kind. And they're not running from us either. We're so far away from them. They're actually not bothered by our presence at all. Yes, yeah, settle down now. Settle down, youngster. <laughs> Even mom's wanting to join in. She actually swung her neck like that. They seem to be all riled up. Perhaps they put a bit too much sugar in their coffee this morning. But the one female is not interested at all. She's probably going, I'm way too old for all of this nonsense. <laughs> they're so funny. And off they go though, behind the bushes. I think what we're going to do now is we haven't really checked any dams this morning at all. So I think we might go towards Tree House Dam. The wildebeest moved off of the plains and went down that way. Let's see, maybe these kudu start running around for us again because that could be quite nice. I don't know what they're looking at. Oh, there's another kudu far away. That's what they're turning back and looking at. No, they are relaxed now. They've obviously been told to stop their antics. I think we'll go down that way. Alice, is there anything on the dam cam, or is it fairly quiet down that end of the world too? Let's see. Maybe this. She. Maybe we'll let's go to the. N not a soul in sight, says Alice. Should we go see if there's some birds? Maybe just because. There's a maintenance vehicle that's just gone down this road, so I don't want to follow them and eat their dust. So we can go to the dams a little bit later. Uh, when we had all our signal problems earlier, uh, Aubrey said that he was at a treehouse dam, and he actually joked, and he says, for once, there's not, there wasn't even a hyena track around the dam. So we need to find the new watering hole, the local watering hole for the big cats. I used to love that one. Some giraffe tracks going down the road too. They look fairly fresh. Maybe we bump into the tallest animal in the world. Yeah, they look like they're on top of yesterday's tracks, so that's good. Let's see if I can follow them. It's what was happening here, but it's not a particularly deep slope at all. 
it's a very gradual uh, decline here back onto Twin Dams. Okay, let's go this way. Have you noticed, Seb, every time that we turn the car, I don't know why our bodies go with it. <laughs> I always find that so funny. I must just be careful that when I turn this way, I don't lean too far the car to the right, otherwise I'm going to fall out. Well, that could be quite funny, though, I can imagine. I'd have a laugh. Cry afterwards, but I'd probably laugh in the beginning. Okay, we're almost at the dam. Well, there's not much in terms of footprints around here. I don't know where the giraffe tracks went. They didn't come this way. They must have gone back the other side. But we'll start here and we'll go back the other way. Maybe a woodpecker. Woodpecker would be nice. Crested barbet singing its... Well, I don't think crested barbet sings a beautiful tune. I think they make up for it with their stunning feathers. Batelier. Batelier flying very far and high in the sky. Alice, sorry, can you repeat that again? Ah, there we go. Now a question from Elizabeth and that is are orphaned animals ever rehabilitated in parts of Africa? It doesn't seem to be much down here. We'll have a look at the Egyptian geese and the hardy ibises that are wading through the water. So yes Elizabeth they are indeed. However the only problem is is that those animals becoming completely wild it's it's such a difficult one. There's obviously there's two sides to every story here. I find with big cats, if you're hand feeding them, I don't think that they can truly be released back into the wild and live on their own. I think that you know you'd have to be so careful if they've had human contact. You know things like elephants. That happens quite often. But remember, what's happening with an elephant is that it's being released into a herd. So I know there's a couple of places throughout South Africa as well as in Kenya and, and other parts of the world where they will save orphaned animals like that so that may their, their mothers, typically the mothers have been lost to poaching so then it's important for us to step in because we were the reason that that adult um, was killed and they raise them into an age until they can sort of fend for themselves and then they release them again and so far it seems to be successful but you've got to be very careful when you do things like that you've got to be so careful so it's a difficult one to go through what are you, are you mobbing? come and have, have a look here Seb sorry there's white crest, not white crested the helmet shark, not, what am I talking about? the southern white crowned sharks, that's what I was trying to say to you, are chasing something I think it was a little lizard buzzard uh, I'm going to see they're behind us. If I go back, we might be able to see them again. You can hear them. They're not happy. But this is my worst. I hate reversing on a damn wall. No, I'm not. I'm too nervous because I can't see the drop. And, and unfortunately, the damn wall is actually starting to erode on either side of the dam now, which is a big problem. So you, you just make one move and then you could topple off the side. I'll turn around down here quickly. They're still chasing it. I don't know what it was. It was, a little, it was one of the little raptors. They're not happy with that though. Making a whole lot of noise. Mobbing it. <laughs> if you're watching the dam cam, you might see a tractor coming down to the water's edge too. <laughs> Where are you going? What are you going to do down there? I don't know, maybe they're just trying to repair something. Let's go on the other side. Let's see if we can find this little raptor that was being chased. Is that Rexon? <laughs> hey! It's Rexon, the tractor man. <laughs> He's one of the guys, but he also forms part of the conservation team. And making sure that everything is good goodness gracious hopefully they're going to repair that road now yeah, they've all gone but there's a white crown shrike up top don't fly please don't fly before we show you there must have been about five or six of them though all flying about 
mobbing and chasing away whatever that raptor was. Like I, said, I didn't really see who it was. It was so quick. The, the noise actually attracted me to look in that direction. And these are beautiful birds. I don't know why it took me so long to get southern white crowned shrike out. I went, what did I say? White crested helmet shrikes and then I said another bird. Is there a whole bunch before I eventually got to this one? But amazing creatures. Sometimes you see them in groups together, otherwise you can't see them on their own. Okay, so not much happening in Foyotella Dam. So we will go and try and find the giraffe, which is which footprints went that way, so we will go that way. It seems as though the mar is filled with gremlins at the moment. Perhaps it's contagious. Maybe they've decided or they, they're traveling through the cables or through our frequencies. Who knows how they're getting into Kenya? They're everywhere, these pesky gremlins. So it's quite interesting. We've been seeing a lot of the guari trees starting to develop the little fruits. And there's actually not many that have started on this side. So I wonder if it's just a particular soil type. But they seem to prefer elsewhere. Oh, this one's got little bits, but they're so far behind. I think the first ones, the first quarry trees that are going to fruit are going to be the ones on Impala Plains because we've been watching those things develop now for quite some time and I haven't checked on them in ages. And so perhaps this afternoon for the safari, that'll be something that we go and do is go and see how big the fruits have got. But those ones are just starting out, so they've definitely got a couple of weeks to go. Then we will check on our num num. As well, that's not far from where we are now and see if that's got any more fruits that we can eat. I wouldn't mind having a little num num for breakfast. That would be very tasty. Actually, just thinking about that does make me salivate about both of these fruits because they're so delicious and really tasty. I wish you could all taste them too. What's your least favorite fruit, Seb, out in the bush? Alice says she used to hate kiwis as a child. No, Alice out of the bush. <laughs> the day I see a kiwi tree, I'll be so excited. Oh, Seb. Oh, not Alice. Oh, Alice. The, Alice loves kiwis. You didn't like them. As a child. Now you like them. And the bush fruit? I don't know. Yeah, I don't really eat bush fruit. Seb says he doesn't really eat bush fruit. It's probably because I don't give him a chance to, and I snatch them up before he gets. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to try and find some. We keep fighting against the birds and the monkeys for the fruits. It's very frustrating. I still have not had a jackalberry fruit. The last time I had one was maybe a year and a half ago, maybe even longer, two years. When I first started guiding in the sand, which is so sad. Well, it would be a little bit longer than that then. Which makes me very sad, of course, because I like the jackalberry fruits. Anyway, speaking of gremlins and fighting them off, it seems as though Scott has worked out his own technique at how to battle them. Let's go and find out how he's been and what he's been seeing. Hello, everyone. We have been racing around frantically trying to get you guys into position of these five male cheetah. We had a visual of them, but we were on the wrong side of a river called the Talek River. And I urge any of you that know how to build bridges to come out here and build some bridges for us. Because a bridge is what we needed today. We've actually had to exit the reserve and then come back in in order to be on the right side, the southern side of this riverbed and let's hope we can get you to these cheetah ASAP. We've probably got about another two or three kilometers to go before we get there I'm guessing. I'm a little bit discombobulated but basically if Ferg just kind of points the camera to the right you'll see a belt of woodland. Within that woodland is a river called the Talek River and we were on the other side of that and couldn't cross. I'm hoping the tree basically directly in front of us that you can see on the horizon, that one there, that little one, I think that's where the cheetah were earlier, if my little memory serves us correctly. 
and they were on the move so who knows where they've gone but I'm guessing there'll still be some vehicles there with them which will help us Hello to Naomi, you would like to know if we're allowed to off-road um, like we are at Juma and yes we don't have uh, the exact amount of free rain as in Juma. It's a little bit more complicated. There's certain areas where we can and certain areas where we can't. Um, and it wasn't a matter of off-roading there because there was a big river we needed to, to cross. So even if we had have attempted to drive off the road, we would have been stuck. It was also quite steep banks down into the river. So that wasn't an option. Had it have been one, I may have quietly broken the law, if need be. Only kidding. I'm a law-abiding citizen most of the time. Oh my gosh, Scott, you need to work on your Taekwondo techniques. It works so well when it comes to fighting the gremlins. But yes, they're about today. Maybe it's the cooler weather. Maybe because the air is slightly thinner, they can travel faster. I don't know, I'm just talking absolute nonsense now. So nothing at Chele Pat. Well, there was a day cam. We tried to get it and as Sebastian was leveling the camera, of course, I don't know how the day cam and why it panicked because we were so far away from it ran off which was a pity though because I, we were both just saying we both don't think we've ever seen a Dacre drinking water before they don't come down to and drink water every single day like some of the other animals out here again just like the Kude they get a lot of moisture from the forbs and the shrubs and things that they're feeding on and from the dew but we'll go towards Treehouse Dam We've got quite a way to go though. We're just on Twin Dams now. I don't think we're going to go down to Twin Dams because there's also pesky gremlins that live there that we'll check this side. Uh, actually, just checking down in the Mulwati quickly. Some sneaky spots that the leopards like to lay in and not cross the roads, but it doesn't seem like there's anything down there. Not even an Inyala. Where are you, animals? Oh, there's some kudu. Let's we'll see if we can see the kudu. We'll just go around and along this way. Not sure what they found in Torchwood. Maybe lions or a leopard. Oh no, we won't see the kudu. They're very far into the thicket. See, they've all moved in there. There's a group of impala as well, doing exactly what they normally do when the wind picks up, as they move away from the open areas to try and find just some shelter. Also listening to the radio to find out what animal they're talking about. I'm not quite sure if it's lions or leopards just yet. Yeah, no tracks. Not even a hyena footprint. Lots of impala tracks. Oh, what we will do is when we get to the dam, we will stop and have a look and see if we can find that little blacksmith lapwing chick that I was telling you about yesterday. Maybe it'll be out. It's so small too. It couldn't be too old. It must only be a couple of days old. Yeah. This dam feels like it's so far away now. Rochelle, you're wondering if I've ever seen any lions, leopards and hyenas and animals like that ever eating birds. Uh, no, I must think. I need to quickly try and think. Oh, hi Impala. Here, this is where you are. Mm, off the top of my head, I've watched lions try and catch vultures before, but weren't successful. Uh, what else have I seen? I have. I've seen leopards catching... And my favorite one is probably the leopard that caught the Egyptian goose right in front of my room in Zambia. That was amazing. So yes, they do go after birds and you'll s you often see the young lions and and then of course the young leopard cubs too going after Franklins when when their hunting skills are just starting to develop. 
they obviously use them to practice on that and squirrels too and the poor terrapins they don't stand a chance do they we saw that we saw Hosanna all on his own but actually between him and Votomi they took care I reckon about of about 20 percent of the entire terrapin population in the Sabi sands they caught so many their diet just was um, just consisting of terrapins at one point remember they were finding scales and bits and shards of shell in the dung it couldn't have been a very nice to feed on but let's go past the impala because I want to go and have a look for that little chick but um but yes there's lots of different animals will catch birds and most of the predators too especially when they're young and sort of the first thing they can catch guinea fowl leopards love to catch guinea fowl I've actually watched Karula on a number of different occasions try and stalk guinea fowl and leopards down in the south and in Zambia too stalking things like that Serval are my favourite. Serval like to catch birds. They leap out of the uh, leap into the air, sorry, and we'll try and catch them. That's quite amazing. Carrick will do the same thing. Let's go through here. Okay, we're we're almost there. I promise. We've got like another three minutes to go. <laughs> right. Okay, we're not far. There's also another good drainage line to check just as we're driving along. I'm going to keep my eyes scanned down in there in case I see something. It'd be a nice spot actually to lay there. I would lay there. Let's see, it's difficult to see and there's lots of trees and things but it's almost like a shelf on the edge of that drainage line and it'd be such a nice little spot to warm yourself up. Ooh. Maybe there's going to be a hippo in Treehouse Dam. There's some hippo tracks going along the road, going straight towards the water. I'll be able to tell you in T minus 30 seconds. We're almost there. I can see the dam wall now. Please be a leopard. Please be a leopard. Please be a male lion. Please be anything. Okay, I'm gonna have to go on the other side to find little blacksmith lapwing chick because that's where it was yesterday. Actually, I just want to see if, see if I can spot it from this side. I think Seb, can we have a look at the blacksmith lapwing that's on the other side of the? Because I think that's where it was hanging around yesterday. That's where that little chick was. But they do wonder from their parents. I don't actually see it there. I hope it made it through the night. I'm going to scan the water's edge. Oh, I can see. You know where I think it is? I don't know if it's that. Can you go? You see how the it sort of bends around like that? If you, There we go. He's there. No, those. There it is. There it is. Are there two of them? There are two little blacksmith lapwing chicks. Woohoo! I thought I was going to get unlucky and there were going to be three banded plovers, but they're not. Now, have others have been told to walk around in that area. So, even at just a few days old, they are able to fend for themselves and, and, well, find food for themselves. They might not be doing a great job, but at least they're practicing it. You know, pecking at the water's edge, trying to collect any insects that might be stuck on the surface. It will take quite a bit of practice. But look at those legs. Those legs and feet are way too big for the rest of its body. And that's amazing, because I only thought that there was one here. And obviously, there were two all along and Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing are definitely keeping a close eye on them. I got saying to you yesterday they made a concerted effort to chase the turtle dove away and our turtle dove is not interested in these chicks and they're not territorial either the turtle dove so I mean it just was really coming down for a drink well Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing were not standing for it at all they said get lost go and drink on the other side of the dam but that's quite sweet so at least we've got some more little chicks to come and have a look for and make sure that they grow up and become nice and strong and then of course those ones Mr. and Mrs. Three-Banded Plover of Chitwa Dam we need to follow uh, their sort of incubation of their eggs that they've got at the moment I think we saw how many eggs did we see? Seb? Was it two? It was two here. No I think it was I think it was two I remember the, I shared a picture I thought, it was either two or three but I hope that they also hatch We'll have to go and check. The hardest part though is not really knowing where they're going to, when, where they were laid. That's exactly what I was going. Let's, let's go a little bit forward. There's another bird. 
Jennifer, you're wondering how many days old are these birds are? I have absolutely no idea. They're not particularly old. I wouldn't say more than... I don't know. I'm completely basking here. Um, you could say any age. But the fact that they're moving further and further away from, their, from the adults makes me think that maybe they're a couple of days old, maybe just shy of a week. But remember, we've been coming down here almost every single day and we haven't seen them. So they could even be younger than that. Basically, once they've hatched, they're ready to go. <laughs> it's so great. They get up, you know, might be a little bit, little bit wobbly in the beginning. A couple of hours later, they'll be running around absolutely no problem, like little chickens would do. So they, they're very, they're capable of just going off on their own. Let's check in some of these famous leopard trees. Well, once used to be famous leopard trees. We've got a lilac breasted roller, we'll have a look at that as well. How amazing was that sighting we had yesterday? There it is, just up there. The courtship that we saw between the lilac breasted rollers, that was quite nice. I thoroughly enjoyed that. You all got some great screenshots too of that sort of intimate moment how they rubbed up against each other. Oh, <laughs> had a scratch and almost fell off its perch. Luckily, you've got wings and you recovered quite well. You made that look very natural, like you were supposed to do that. That's what I tend to try and do as well when I slip and tumble, you know, I pretend I've just, I know, it's just picking something up or you can do a somersault and ta-da. See what other birds we've got around here. It's amazing though, you know, we, normally we're lucky and the birds are great gap fillers, but even they seem to be taking a break. I don't know where they've all gone to. It's not like the ones that we're seeing now are, are migrants or anything. They hang around in these areas, they're residents. Perhaps they've just moved off to a different part of Duma, where there's maybe more insects around if they are insect feeders. And I suppose all the birds that are eating fruits are going to be down in the drainage lines feeding on the jackal berries because that's the next fruit that's that's almost ripe some of them can't control themselves they can't wait they're not very patient and they've already started eating uh, the bright green ones and they're quite sour something I've always wondered is the taste but do birds have taste buds I don't actually you know I've actually got a good book here but it would take me a bit of time to scroll through to see if they talk about taste buds on birds Maybe not. Maybe they don't have any at all. Or not as many as us as humans have. Let's see what else we've got. Oh, you see, that's the sad thing is these pans in Shibamo that used to bring so many different types of animals here have completely dried up, so there's no reason for, the, for them to come around here. Okay, we'll go back up Shibamo because we haven't driven this road yet this morning. It's also so normally a good road to drive. that nothing Wow so Chantal's just done a bit of interwebbing she says that birds do have taste buds they have between 300 and 400 taste buds whereas we as humans have 9,000 that is amazing thank you Chantal that's very interesting it would have been in this book but like I said it's just a nightmare to try and scroll through it right now and try and drive um, but that's quite interesting Okay, so I wonder if they're affected by the sort of t the tartness of that fruit because if you've ever put a jackal berry fruit in your mouth and it's, it's terrible, it's not nice. And of course they will have that sourness to it because they don't want anything to eat it just yet because we find that the seeds probably haven't even developed properly. Well, that's quite interesting. Well we know where to find the go away birds and the African green pigeons and the crested barbets. That's on Inyala Road North. We just go there and guaranteed to see those sightings. What else is around here likes to eat fruit? Oh, there's so many different types of birds that eat fruit. I think the three that I mentioned are the most common. It's really a pity that we don't see the purple crested taraco and we don't see the trumpeter hornbills as often as we as we like. Every now and then you hear the trumpeter hornbills on the dam cam. I'm not sure where they're feeding though that you'd hear them. Because there don't seem to be any particularly big fruit trees near the dam. Other than if you go maybe towards the uh, the rooms at Vuyatela Lodge. I suppose there's a couple of big jackalberries in there, but that's it. 
it's not littered with fruit trees. Oh my goodness, we've only got five minutes left. What are we going to find? Animals, show yourselves. Dakers, Stiernbork. Flock of guinea fowl, that would be nice. I wouldn't mind sitting watching a flock of guinea fowl. Frolic about in the grass. Kicking maybe open some elephant dung. Wouldn't that be nice? Check it on there. Very quiet in terms of tracks. The odd hyena track, but no lion tracks. Plenty of impala tracks. Please, everybody, put positive vibes out to the world today that the elephants return because I really am missing them. I need an elephant fix. It's, it's been a quiet few days. Hi, could you don't run? Let me go. Let me see if I can go back because it was a, actually. That one might be a bit better over there. So there's this kudu cow that's just standing off to the right. And this is actually where Shadow had a kill once. She had a little, I think it was a Dacre kill. That morning when we had five leopards in like about a two kilometer radius. Remember Ali and I were driving. It was so exciting. We had Tingana on a warthog kill. And we had Shadow and Cub that were here but they disappeared. They got a fright when Herbie got farmed them. And then we also had Tamba and Shongile. That was an amazing morning. That was the leopard, was really the leopard fiesta. And what did I say? It was so funny as I ended the show, I went, leopard fiasco. <laughs> and then started giggling and went, tell that was the complete opposite of the word. <laughs> Sometimes I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Actually, most of the time. And off they go. It's not many kudu here, just two. I don't think it's the same kudu that we saw earlier that were on quarantine. I'm sure that they're still trying to move around. But there they are. They're feeding on monkey oranges at the moment. I've actually seen lots of animals feeding on those types of trees. They must be particularly tasty at this time of the year. Very delicately pulling off each leaflet. Not making a sound. You wouldn't actually even know that they were in here. Right, let's continue to quarantine and see maybe we get some last minute animals. I like last minute animals, they're quite nice. Lots of impala down there. <laughs> Hi impala, are you sitting down to have a rest? Now Adela and Natalie, you've said what do I think is the best animal sound that I can make? I don't know. What is the best animal sound that I can make? What do you think? I can do vervet monkey. I've been practicing. I obviously don't know how to shout leopard or lion in vervet monkey because the impala don't seem to be too bothered by me at all. They probably just said, we're just trying to get a rest, Taylor. Stop making noise. I'm, I'm not particularly good with making the animal sounds, unfortunately. Sometimes I think I can whoop like a hyena, but I, I really cannot. It just sounds like an animal with a sore throat really sorry fellas I didn't mean to wake you you can go back to sleep now I'm going I'll leave you all so I'm not sure Seb what animal noise do you like to make or can you make okay go for it that's impressive that's much better you know whoop than I can do <laughs> Can do the Heidi da. <laughs> that is the worst Heidi da sound I've ever heard in my entire life. I hope you all heard that I did. Said went nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I don't know if we have a bird that go, now it sounds like you're do you're going caca caca. <laughs> no, Seb. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my goodness. Well. It seems as though Sebastian and I need to obviously work on making animal sounds. So perhaps we'll practice so we're well prepared to keep you all entertained for the sunset safari. Now we haven't got much time left but I hope you enjoyed it. Of course, apologies for all the gremlins that you've met during the day but at least it was quite fun. Elephants with Steph, wild dogs with me and who knows um, what you saw with everybody else. But I'm sure it was wonderful and fantastic. I hope you all get a good rest and we remember to join us this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. Thanks everyone.